go ahead and open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, this morning we'll be in verses 18 through 25. And um, you guys know, and I, I talk about the, the proclamation of the gospel uh, in each and every service and each and every sermon that, as Spurgeon says, uh, my primary job, the, the preacher's primary job, is to, in whatever text we are in, make a beeline to the cross. And so whether we are in Hebrews or 1 Corinthians or as we were just in in Summer in the Psalms, uh, it is all gospel content. It is all cross-centered theology and preaching. Now, today, I, I, I hope to give you a little bit of a picture and a glimpse as to why that is. Why we say that, why the, the preaching of the text is cross-centered. And so, if you will join me, please, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called both the Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Let's pray. Lord, would you in a supernatural way this morning impact us with the power of the cross? God, I ask that over this Time now as I get ready to deliver a message that is far greater than me to a people who need to receive a message far greater than them. Lord, may the cross be exalted and lifted up. In Jesus' name, amen. John Piper, in his book, Don't Waste Your Life, which is generally a good way to approach things, says, Life is wasted if we do not grasp the glory of the cross. Cherish it for the treasure that it is and cleave to it as the highest price of every pleasure and the deepest comfort in every pain. What was once foolishness to us, a crucified God, must become our wisdom and our power and our only boast in this world. See, the Corinthians became entranced by <clears throat> human rhetoric and, and ability and they had forgotten the very roots of their faith. Right, that, that's what we looked at. See, see, we are a people of the cross. So when we talk about the, the roots of our faith, faith we, we talk about the cross. See, without the cross, there is no Christian religion. There is no authentic salvation, for there is no redemption of sin apart from the cross. Apart from the cruel death of Jesus Christ upon that cross, shedding his blood and dying, there is no cause, reason, or ability for this faith that we claim to have. Now, though the cross is, is too gruesome for many civilized minds, it is the heart and the foundation of Christ's church. And it is here upon this that we must stand and never waver. Look, look you can build an apparent faith without the cross. You can build a comfortable religion without the cross. You can build something that you call a church without the cross, but listen to me, you can never embrace Christ without reckoning with his cross, and you can never be embraced by Christ apart from the cross. In America, we're seeing a, a comfortable version of Christianity that doesn't proclaim the vulgarity and the gruesomeness of the cross, right? They would say, well, focus on the love of God opposed to his wrath. And how God comes in to save the day and, and make you a better person and, and has re really taken care of everything that you need. Instead of saying, I, I'm of Paul or I'm of Apollos, the, the language is, well, I'm of helpful life transformation and that's what I want to give people. Christy and I, many years ago, were at a 
church service that I feel like haunts me to this day might be strong language, but uh, we're there and, 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 as the, and, and we're just visiting his guest and, and the pastor gets up and, and they're working through this series and, and, it, and it's neat. Like they, they've got cool graphics. Like we, we got cool graphics too, right? First Corinthians. Um, but but it, was, it said guardrails. And I'm like, okay, well, that, that's interesting. And so, so he begins talking about guardrails and these guardrails that you need in your life as you're going down this road and you don't want to go off this way or this way. And so here's the guardrails and, and, and all of the guardrails, it's like seven or eight different guardrails and they're all just random things that help you lead a better, more productive life. This is going to be in first Corinthians, Paul's reminder to the Corinthian church. You focus on anything other than the cross and you've emptied it of its power. See, because they look to something else. Paul's going to bring them back and say, it's not anything else. It's not, here's seven tips to live a great life. It's you root yourself in the cross because the cross is the essence of your salvation. See, we begin in 18, and he's linking himself back to what he's just said before he opens it up with the word for, right? In our text saying, because of what I just said, right? And you, you think back to last week, he, he talked about that cult of personality, right? He says, you're following men, you're saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas. You're following men, you're making divisions. When Paul says, there should be no divisions, you're looking with your eyes and you're trying to choose based on your understanding, your wisdom, who you like best. What philosophy or theology system you think you like best. What method or manner of ministry you desire. And he says, your wisdom ignores the power of the cross. Because in the power of the cross, there is no power in Paul, in Apollos, in Cephas. It rests in the cross. Which is why Paul's so adamant. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Right, adamantly he is opposed to this because all of them point to the cross. And so if you focus on them, you've missed everything they've said. You're not really of Paul or Apollos or Cephas because they're of the cross. And in our text this morning, Paul will make at least three important theological observations about the cross. First one I want you to see in verse 18 is that the cross appears differently. The way that the cross is going to appear divides all of humanity into two camps. The saved and the perishing. Look at 18. Now it opens up and it says the, the word of the cross. It, it means the proclamation of the gospel. The preaching of the gospel is a preaching of the cross. Here's where I want to be, be gracious and, and kind, but, but also very open and upfront. Not all preaching is good preaching. Don't say amen while I'm the one doing it. Not all preaching is accurate preaching. Not all church ministry is biblically faithful ministry. See, we have in our time and cultural moment, churches out of a desire to be more relevant or friendly or whatever other means, they preach and they teach and they encourage, but a cross-centered gospel is not the message. I, I hesitate to, to say certain things, but, but like, that's why sometimes I, I wish this wasn't recorded, but it is what it is. Um, I, I don't even, I, I don't remember. I, I know a lot of them did it. I just, you know, scrolling through social media, I, I saw a lot of stuff come up about a church recently that did a sermon series at the movies, right? And, and they come out and they're dressed up like movie characters. And, and I kid you not, the entire premise of what their focus was going to be on that day were truths you can learn from Toy Story. That was the content Look, I just want to help you think through some of this. Uh, if you move to another church one day, right, what are you looking for? Because we live in a time where the building up through really encouraging sermon series is kind of the prominent, predominant philosophy. Now, Paul assumes that biblical proclamation of the gospel is cross-centered, right? The word of the cross, the division comes because the message that's preached is a cross-centered message. 
And this is the message that's preached. It's the word of the cross. The New Testament has no inclination or friendliness towards a Christianity that exists apart from the cross. And boy, what a divide it creates, right? If, if you look at verse 18, the first thing that we see is it, it appears, right? I said the cross appears differently. The first thing it appears as is folly. Folly or foolishness. It, literally, the encapsulation of the gospel of Christ is foolish to those who are perishing. Now, to put this in context for our first century reader, right, the cross was, was really nothing more than a well-known uh, device for execution. Think like electric chair or the needle used for lethal injection. And it's far more gruesome than anything that we've seen in our recent history, but, but it was a tool of the government to execute judgment upon those criminals that it deemed deserving of it. Now, because it was so brutal and many despised it, one Roman orator named Cicero uh, said this of the cross. The very word cross should be removed not only from the person of a Roman citizen, but from his thoughts, his eyes, and his ears. See, it wasn't civilized enough for the glory that was Rome and its citizens. This was for the worst of the criminals. Now think about it then, this is the very manner, this despised thing that most Roman citizens were encouraged not to think about or dwell on. This is the very manner that the apostles came preaching the Messiah, the Savior of the world, experienced death through. In other words, the God of eternal ages hung upon a cross that they believe most people shouldn't even see. But well, you mean to tell me that your God gave the life of his son and not in some beautiful ritual, right? Because they had plenty of those in the first century. Didn't even give his life, right, in some kind of beautiful ritual, but on a cross, exposed to shame and ridicule, flayed open and nailed upon it for the, for the public to wag their tongues and deride him. They couldn't believe that any God of glory would do this. And it remains the same today. For the notion that the king makes you healthy, wealthy, and wise is easily accepted. But the teaching that the king became the suffering servant who died and now calls you to take up your cross, it's not a popular one, is it? For our world cannot see what power could ever exist in death. They can't see what glory could possibly come from weakness, what riches could come from poverty, and therefore it becomes foolish. Right? This is the way that the cross divides, and I said it appears differently. To those who see the cross as foolishness, their path is a perishing one. Those who don't reckon with the cross and only see it as a foolish impossibility are those who Paul says are perishing now, Paul will use this term many times in his letters. He's talking about kind of that final state of destruction. But notice that he isn't saying one day they will perish. Though that is true, they are currently perishing. And so listen to me. As you sit right now in this room, as you're here this morning, if your approach to the cross of Christ hasn't been belief and acceptance, then you're not in eventual danger. You are in the mode of perishing. If there were an abyss and you had fallen over the edge, right? you are right now plunging headlong into the depths. Your life is destruction even as you sit and breathe right now in this moment. There is no, oh, maybe I'll figure this out in a little bit. Maybe I'll grab the edge eventually and pull myself up. You are dead and dying at the same time. But I said that the cross appears differently. Right? There's another way of seeing this activity of God in the death of his son. In verse 18, you see that it also appears as power. See, Paul's going to contrast those who are perishing with those who are being saved. For the saved is not 
The cross is not foolishness. It is the power of God unto salvation, Romans 1, 16. The cross of Christ is what saves us right? in all three tenses. We're saved. That means we're, we're justified in a moment. We are forgiven of sins. We are being saved. That, that is sanctified, the continual process of salvation. And we will be saved ultimately in the end. That is glorified. But, but notice the division. One says it's foolish. The other says it's power. And it's interesting, as most of us would read comparisons and like kind of anticipate what is the next thing about to come, if it is not foolishness, then it must be wise. Paul doesn't go to wisdom immediately, though, does he? The opposite of foolishness. That's what we might expect, but he chooses the word power. It's not an accident, right? Inspired by the Spirit of God. See, what they need is not more understanding about their situation. What you need is not just more wisdom and head knowledge to figure it out. You need rescue. They need power to provide the redemption that saves them. The the word sozo in the Greek for salvation there. It's talking about God's deliverance or rescue from his end time wrath. When the text says that the people are perishing, ultimately when we die and we face the judgment of God because we are sinners under his wrath, we will receive eternal punishment and damnation in hell. And so when we talk about salvation in Christ, it isn't just a move to believing a religious system. I'm just going to start going to church and I'm going to try to just figure out what it is they believe. Coming to church more, trying to be a better spouse or a parent. None of that is sozo salvation. It is a radical reorientation. The Bible speaks of it like new birth or a new creation. The salvation of God is the rescuing you from the falling down into the pit that I mentioned. Right? He reaches down. He grabs a hold of you and he pulls you up to himself. And when your eyes are open to the gospel, when you see the power of the cross to rescue you and you trust by faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, there is an instantaneous redemption that occurs. You might not understand all of it. It's okay, it is the power of God unto salvation. Some of you come every week and you're just trying to figure it out. What you believe, what you should believe. And if this really makes enough sense for you to embrace it. So I want you to hear me. While you are perishing, it will never look like wisdom. But it can look like power. And power is what you need. For you are a sinner and you cannot pay your sins penalty. This is what the cross of Christ did. See, when Jesus came and lived sinless, he was living the life that you should have lived and couldn't. And when he died, he was suffering under the wrath of God, which was stored up for you. So he sheds his blood on the cross, and Jesus pays for your sins. He pays the penalty you owe to God, so that if you merely see and embrace that, you will receive rescue. See, God has the power to forgive, but that power flows only through the power present in the cross. And so I'm pleading with you, all right, stop looking for the wrong thing, right? It's okay to, to come and be curious and to look and, and all of those, but, but if you continue to look for the wrong thing, you're never going to find the right thing, right? You're looking for answers when, when you need the power of rescuing grace. And so I would ask you even this morning, would you acknowledge your own sin and repent and place faith in Jesus Christ for salvation? Would you be willing to stop waiting for the cross to stop being foolish and embrace it in its foolishness? See, the apostle is going to make a shift to talk about wisdom because they were wondering, right? They want to know. They thought, well, power comes from wisdom. The more I know, the the better shape I'm in. Number two, the cross, I, I said the cross appears differently, but number two, the cross has a different wisdom. In verses 19 through 21, right, you can see it, for, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. And so the cross has a different 
wisdom, right? The Bible does not disapprove of wisdom or knowledge. In fact, Proverbs tells us to pursue it. The real question is, is it the right knowledge and wisdom? See, the quote in 19 is from Isaiah 29, 14. Isaiah prophesied that Jerusalem would be attacked, but they would escape ultimate destruction. The problem is that the other prophets, those who claim to be wise, and the people look to for wisdom, they didn't understand what the Lord was doing because their hearts were far from him. And so they sought a different type of wisdom. See, Paul is saying, like in his day, God is choosing to frustrate the wisdom of those who claim to be wise apart from him. He's showcasing, and will continue to do so, that they're actually fools, right? God ensures us through this whole book that human beings will have no basis for pride in their own wisdom or their own ability to come to know God. That they could not know him or devise his ways on their own. And so we get this kind of polemic, this war against worldly wisdom. Now, verse 20 is listing groups that were considered to be wise, and, and Paul asks the question, has not God made foolish all their versions of wisdom? Has God not made foolish all the wisdom of the world? Those who deem themselves wise are limited, and he slips in this phrase, of this age. Think about how finite your knowledge becomes when compared this age versus the age to come. The age to come where eternity abounds. The greatest philosophers can speculate but have no handle on the millennia that lie ahead. They're limited. We are limited by our measly scope within our own age. Sure, we can learn and deduce certain things of history, but all of that relies on what we've read or been told or unearthed up to this point. In history books that were written about ancient civilizations, they have to be changed almost every time a new archaeological dig unearths something else. Right? Science is ever expanding and revising and, and transforming long held assumptions. There is a wisdom to the world. But the extreme finite nature of it is astounding when we consider the will of God in ages to come. But we don't really consider that much, do we? I mean, that's the problem that Paul is addressing. Humanity tends to think it is much wiser and further ahead than we really are. See, we tend to be extremely arrogant and think that we know far more than we do. Uh, our stars of wisdom that the world upholds on lofty pedestals are currently trying to figure out the concept of male and female. Folks, we're not getting any wiser as a people group. But this is what we do. We hold up as the ideal of wisdom whatever new philosophy mesmerizes us the most. Right? In the Enlightenment, it used to be science. Well, God must be wrong. Look at all the discoveries we've made. We discovered something. Therefore, we have no need for the divine anymore. You moved to America during the Industrial Revolution, and, and it was the God of business, right? Wealth became kind of the new thing to be worshipped. You leave modernism, and you move to postmodernism, and there's no end in sight to the ridiculous debating that occurs when people don't believe in truth anymore. And then really today is almost a post-postmodernism. We, we lack any bearing on lives determined by any wisdom outside of ourselves, and we truly think anything within is the new God that should be exalted and praised. See, as a culture, we dwell in lunacy. Friendships aren't even friendships. They happen in an intangible world of social media. Look, here's the point. The wisdom of this age, Paul is saying, is no wisdom at all. And here's why. The, the world, in all of its wisdom never found the truest truth in all of the universe. Look at verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, the world's failure in its wisdom is monumental. The greatest truth in all of the universe, that God exists and is a personal being who desires to interact with his people, the greatest minds in the universe to ever exist, couldn't come to these conclusions that God wanted to save humanity. See, worldly wisdom fails spectacularly because it has no place for God. And God has done this on purpose. We see it. God, in His wisdom, rejects our pride and arrogance, and He makes Himself impossible to find through our own pursuit of worldly wisdom. For if the knowledge of God came through human wisdom, those who were gifted in thought and philosophy, then the scholars of this world could boast that they were superior to the rest of humanity. That then they would be the, 
the new mediators of, to, to whom all of us would have to approach for salvation because they had the knowledge that we didn't have. But in God's wisdom, he says that all people lack saving knowledge of God. God determines in his infinite wisdom that human wisdom would not and never will be the pathway to God. For then humanity would have cause to boast. Instead, he chooses to use what we see as foolish to actually be the manner through which we stop being fools. So in God's wisdom, notice what the text says. He chooses the folly of what we preach. Literally, the content and the method is folly. So we gather together. I prepare and I come to preach, which according to the world is foolishness. You gather together, you come to listen, which according to the world is foolishness. We're like a bunch of idiots competing to be the biggest idiot on top of the mountain. We've talked about the message of the cross. We've talked about it being foolish and incomprehensible to the world's wisdom. We've talked about it saving power, but notice in our text... God uses preaching to save those who, what? Believe. Not those who mentally assent to the truth. Not those who figure it out philosophically. Not those who by sheer will or force earn it. Those who believe. Those who see it as the world sees it. Right, But instead of seeing foolishness, they see power. They see the power that they need to rescue them from their sin that they know that they have. And so it is foolishness. That there, is, there is no delusion of grandeur in my mind that most of the world will see what I do literally for a living is foolishness and folly. And as our culture continues in the trajectory that it is, if you gather together on a Sunday morning to listen to me proclaim folly, the world will continue to see you as foolish as well. But I want you to hear me. Though the cross does appear differently, though the cross has a different wisdom, thirdly, the cross is enough. Verses 22 through 25, For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The, the focus on belief in the cross as opposed to wisdom, and the wisdom seeking our world does, is because God removes from humanity any ability to be man-centered in our salvation. One, we can't save ourselves, but two, according to this text, we can't even figure out how salvation works apart from the revelation of God. <clears throat> See, human pride forces us to place ourselves in the path of our own salvation. This is why every other religion has a works-based mentality to whatever version of salvation they claim to hold. That's why also many Christians will, will walk back some of the theology of the New Testament that pre presents every element of salvation as the free gift of God through Jesus Christ. See, in verses 22 through 25, Paul is highlighting this element of human wisdom rooted in pride. He says, Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. They seek what, according to their primary uh, uh, philosophical and religious belief systems, they're seeking what they value. For us today, it could be, well, what accords most with science? Well, that's the religious view I want to hold. Well, what accords most with my financial success? That's my belief system. What accords with the granting of my desires? That's the God I will worship. And because Christianity doesn't do that, it doesn't play the game of giving what we want, when we want, in the way that we want it, the results are similar to the first century. Jews wanted signs. They still didn't believe the signs in front of them. Why? Because the cross was foolish. The Greeks wanted wisdom. They didn't heed the wisdom spoken to them. Why? Because the cross was foolish. And, and so Paul, knowing this, says, we preach Christ crucified. And it's like he's going ahead and telling them, I already know this. A stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. 
Now, lest we become puffed up, God has chosen that method and the content to be foolishness in this world. Just so you know, that's humbling as a preacher. What you stand to proclaim will always be seen by the world's wisdom as foolish. Not just what you say, but even the manner that you say it. According to the world's wisdom, preaching is a fool's errand. And and if we think about it, right, kind of from our human perspective, how in the world is me standing here and yelling at you for 30 or 45 minutes supposed to radically transform your eternity? Right, Your life for billions of years to come can radically be transformed through the act of me preaching the gospel to you. Some of you are like, well, when you say it like that, it really does kind of sound stupid. That's the point. That's the point Paul's making. It is a really dumb method. And God chose to implant his power in it so that no man may boast. So that none of us could be proud, arrogant, or try to take credit. He makes the foolishness of the cross and its preaching the power to save. So we preach the cross. That's what it means when we say here one of our core values is being gospel-centered. It it means it it overlays all of our preaching ministry. So that whether we're in 1 Corinthians or Psalms or, or any other book, we always preach the cross. Because the cross of Christ is the content of this book. From Genesis to Revelation, it is a book about the foolish way in which the Messiah came to redeem in power. And we know, verse 23, it will be a stumbling block. We know it will be foolishness to the world, but we preach Christ crucified. Because 24, to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. See, here it is. We preach Christ crucified because to the called, He is the power and the wisdom. True power and true wisdom. Now, notice in the text that the message that Jesus is the crucified Lord is proclaimed. It is preached to all, but it is only the called who embrace it. This has been one of the predominant themes through the first chapter of Corinthians. It will appear in next week's text as well. Though the message is proclaimed, only those called by God receive it as truth. And they are coming out from both groups, Jews and Gentiles, right? The ones that he just said, they don't understand it. It's a stumbling block and it's folly and they're not going to get it, right? But that's who, that's who God brings to himself. That's who God calls and when awakened to this truth, how do we see Christ? No longer is it a stumbling block and foolishness, but it is wisdom and power, What was once seen as foolish, we can finally see God's grand and wise plan. What was once seen as weakness, we see as the greatest power in the world. Many an atheist has used the argument that religion is just a crutch to lean on. Paul says, only the fool doesn't fall upon the power and wisdom of Christ. See, to embrace your weakness and be picked up and carried by the Savior might not be great in the world's eyes, but in it is great power. How does the old saint of God live with more joy, peace, and serenity than the wealthy and strongest among us? Because they see what the world cannot see. The clarity of this comes home to my wife and I sometimes more starkly. We have people that we love Friends and family from really kind of all over Florida, North Carolina. And they can't understand why we would give up so much to live such terrible lives. Right? We had such potential, right? We we could have lived around them. We we could have made a lot of money and enjoy the things that the world has to offer. Right? And and yet, you chose to go into ministry. Foolish. You chose to... Marry into ministry, extra foolish. Move and do that ministry in a, in a place where you possibly can't do ministry. And right? all the way in Montana, 
It's an extra level of foolishness. And in their eyes, for us to live the rest of our days poor, stressed, and overworked, and and sometimes I'd have to agree, but (laughs) to the degree that we continue to surrender and follow God's call on our lives, conventional wisdom says, yeah, this is going to be the case. But 25 tells me, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. And I wouldn't trade the foolish path that we've been on for anything in this world. Church, we are a people of the cross. We are fools who embrace foolishness. We are the weak who embrace our weakness. And in the cross, we see the very wisdom and power of God that shames the greatest scholars of the earth. I don't doubt that you battle, even today, apparent wisdom versus foolishness. It's a struggle for you. Like, ah, man, I I know the Scriptures teach this, and and I want to live this, and I want to do this, and I want to be this, but... I really got all these other things I got to focus on and I got to align and, and I got to make sure that this is going well with, with my family, with my career, with, with all of these other things. And yet you feel that pull, you feel that tension of, I know that God calls me to this, but, but I'm walking in this and I don't see how I can leave walking in this to walk in that. There is a life that God is calling you to and it looks unappealing. Listen to me, because it looks like foolishness. But there is a cross that stands ever before you. And upon that cross is the lion who became the lamb. Upon that cross is the wisdom of God who became folly. Upon that cross is the beauty of God that became ugliness. Upon that cross is the power of God that became weakness. And upon that cross is the righteousness of God that became sin. That in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Let's pray. Father, I know that to the vast majority of the world, maybe even some in this room this morning, what we do and what we surrender to looks like folly. And it is folly according to the world's wisdom. And so God, would you give us now in this room eyes to see and ears to hear. Not the folly of the world that we've so long walked in, but the wisdom of God that is power in the midst of weakness. Life through death. There is salvation through the cross of Christ. Lord, would you awaken us to that? Maybe for some in here who have never placed faith in Jesus, would you awaken them that to that for the first time this morning? Church, I'm going to ask you just a couple of questions. For some of you in here, you, you come through those doors Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And you've never embraced the cross of Jesus Christ for your salvation. You've never embraced that for your rescue from sin. And so here's what Paul says to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as he wrote to the Corinthians. You, as you sit in your seat right now in this very moment, if you've never embraced Christ through his death, burial, and resurrection, the Bible says you are perishing. That means right now, in these moments, you are dead and dying. But church, there is life in the cross. And many of us in this room know that and have embraced that. And we have seen the power of God to redeem us. And so listen to me. If you're one of those that you you continue to come in and you've never embraced Christ and His cross. Let me just ask you this question. Will this morning be the morning that you finally surrender? 
Because what, what are you waiting on? You don't, you don't have to answer that to me. But you, you have to answer it to yourself. And to God, are, are you waiting on it to make more sense? Are you waiting on it to look like it provides a life of more wisdom and glory? It is foolishness. God intentionally chose to make it look like foolishness so that you would have no thing that you could grab onto and just say, oh, if I can just do this, or I can be this, or I can walk in this, then I'll have it. No, he made it something completely and utterly out of your control. He made your salvation dependent upon the death, burial, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. And so some of you in here have never embraced Jesus for salvation. And I give the gospel every single week, but I, I do this a lot more infrequently. This morning, if you've never embraced Jesus Christ for salvation, look, nobody's looking around but me. The lights are down anyway. It's kind of hard to see. If you've never come to faith in Jesus Christ and been saved and redeemed and rescued by him, but this morning you're tired of fighting. You're tired of running. You're trying to figure out what it is you want to do. If this morning you're just, you're just saying, Pastor, I'm done. I'm, I'm ready to embrace Jesus. Would you just slip your hand up so I can pray for you? Just up and right back down. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I'll, I'll give a moment. And so here's what I want to encourage you with. You, you can pray anything, right? It's, it's not the words of a prayer that, that mean anything. It's the intent of the heart. but maybe you're new to this and you, you don't know, really know how to approach God. You, you could pray something like this. Father, I know that I'm a sinner and I deserve death and hell because of my sin. But I believe you sent your son, Jesus, to die in my place. Would you forgive me and wash me of all of my sin? And I trust him as Lord and Savior. And so if you will do that or similar to that and you will truly from deep down in your heart embrace Christ, the Bible says you will, not just today, but for today and the rest of eternity, you will be saved and transformed. And now instead of death and hell, it will be life and the very presence of God for the rest of eternity. And so church, let me just talk to you for just a quick moment. Right, we, we, we passed that struggle, some of us many years ago, where we, we surrendered and we gave up and we said, all right, I, I'm going to give every bit of my life to Christ and I'm going to ask him to save me through the power of the cross. And yet your struggle is to live in that surrender to the cross. Right, We still want to pursue what we think is wisdom. What we think is helpful and beneficial for our life and our walk. When Paul's already reminded us through the text of Scripture this morning, everything you're going to determine through the world's wisdom to live your life according to the way you would seek to live it is going to be foolishness. And so church, here's what I'm going to ask you. Would you just afresh and anew surrender to the transforming power of the cross? I'm going to invite you to stand. If everybody would stand, we are going to sing and we're going to worship this God who redeemed us through his cross. Communion has been set out for us to receive and probably not a better day to receive this than today. 
As we've talked about the cross and what this literally symbolizes is the blood and the body of Jesus Christ shed and broken for us. And so he says to the church, do this in remembrance of me. And so today, as you are preparing your hearts even now to come and receive this picture of gospel salvation, may we remember and worship at the foot of the cross. Would you respond in the way that God directs when your heart is prepared?